And I would like to welcome my peer pressure guest. Kimber, are you there? I'm here. Hi, Diane. Hi, how are you? Everything's great. <laughs> I'm glad that you're saying that because uh, we have kind of a difficult day in New York. And uh, I guess the first thing on the agenda is what is going on with your show that is supposed to be scheduled for tonight? We are just trying to decide what the best thing to do for all the fans. We're most likely going to postpone because it seems like transportation has been compromised. And I want to be able to present a really glamorous, wonderful show for everyone, and um, I don't I'm not, don't have a way to get all of my props and costumes to the show right now, so we're thinking, hmm, maybe we should wait until we can really deliver the show that is up to our standard and the fan standard, which is um, over the top. And that's, I, I get that that's really a difficult choice for you, seeing that you've been looking forward to this. And, you know, yeah. when I set up this this uh, this special with you and we spoke earlier, you know, you were going to already be at the club at noon preparing for the yeah. show. Like, you put so much into yeah, a performance. it's really fun for me. I love doing it. I love doing it. I, I have sort of... Um, a compulsion to decorate and to um, completely transform the clubs that we do shows in. So I live like three blocks away from Bowery Electric, actually. And even being in such short distance, it's I have so many things I wouldn't be able to walk over there with what I have. I've got a teeter-totter seesaw. I've got babies and tires and flowers and suns, big, you know, uh, um, moons, and a big phallus that we're bringing over for one of our numbers. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't even walk over with the amount of things that, that we've been working on. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a it's a logistical nightmare. And, uh, yeah, Mother Nature <laughs> wins. <laughs> yes, she wins. Tell her that. But um, And you do put so much into your into your performance, at what point in your life did you start really paying attention to, and was there like a, a recollection that you have of a performance that intrigued you or made a real impact on you that sort of pointed you in the direction of what you um, do now? Well, gosh, I started, um, you know, in Los Angeles when I was a teenager, and I always wanted to do you know, like Little Rascals put on a show, because we're always very bored. And um, instead of waiting for things to come to us, we decided to, you know, make up our own little worlds of strange mythologies and stuff in order to entertain our friends. It wasn't likely I had a desire to become a fantastic, great artist. It was just Los Angeles was very boring. I didn't like going to the beach that much when I was a teenager, and um, we just wanted to, you know, design our lives to be the life that we wanted to lead, and we had to do it ourselves. So when I came to New York in 79 and started making performances and films, and when we needed um, to have soundtracks and stuff for our films, instead of using other people's music, we thought, well, we need to, you know... Uh, um, make our own soundtracks, and that's when we started the band, to, to make that music for our visuals and performances that we made. And again, the performances weren't like performance already as much as doing stunts or gags or, or doing little shenanigans and stuff. It was in the spirit of fun and actually like, you know, um, um, defeating boredom. <laughs> um. And well, and the other thing that I want to sort of mention is like you, like your band sounds nothing like a soundtrack. Like if you're sort mm -hmm. of saying like we needed to put music to what we were doing, and and uh, right. you know, I mean, you've always had like really really heavy players, and your I mean, I would call your music, you know, like metal or hard rock. It's not. It doesn't sound like accompaniment. So what kind of music did you grow up on to appreciate that kind of sound? Well, you mean just classic rock? Yeah, or whatever you appreciated that, that, 
that that had you create well yeah ex- exactly like we this music isn't about like movie soundtrack or just background music essentially is what you're saying yeah. we we decided to tie in the performances to the music in other words we started to illustrate the little stunts and shenanigans we were doing with actual props and costumes we sort of married both of the of the mediums like the music was the bread and the 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 visuals were the butter that went on the on the bread so it was just like you know um since i was a little bit younger when i started it took me a while to figure out what i really or how to do what i wanted to do you know with a lot of trial and error and stuff um so you know other words like we had a song like chopsley rabbit bikini model and um i thought well i think i'll build a big taco shell that can eat people on stage and and when it had been in the film it was just simply like a sculpture that was filmed and then you saw realm around in the film screen or when it was in the performance art piece it was just a rather you know quiet little taco shell but with the rock music behind it you know we started to be able to tell the story about chopsley rabbit bikini model Mm -hmm. like um so you know it's it's they're, it's very literal, you know. Um, the props really are props, and the visuals really are talking about what's going in the songs, actually. You know. Have you ever taken on anything like, 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 for instance, in the in the uh, the event of Chopsley, like, like, okay, I'm going to build this, and then you just, you know, it's not working or whatever, and it's so much more work, and and comes out completely different. Um, mm-hmm. Is there is there any one particular song where you were just like I am still trying to get this right and it's bec- become I a monster? All of the others. all of the songs are be getting perfected, you know, as far as building the props and stuff. Because I'm always learning new building techniques. Mm. Um, I started out using foam core and just flat props, and now I've learned how to use like insulation foam um, to build like more sculptural things. I've I've just learned different techniques and any kind of accident that happens usually is a happy accident. Um, you know, and um but I we work in the spirit of availabilism, which is what we say making the best use of what's available as well. So there are actual whole songs and numbers that were just built around those accidents, like finding bowling balls on the street. I, I mm-hmm invented a whole performance art piece just around finding bowling balls one afternoon. Um, it, I, I wrote a whole number um, that, that was about witches who used to be uh, uh, tortured and stuck into Iron Maidens, and there was an artist called Hans Baldung that painted witches with balls tied to their feet. So... Certain songs were born just of me finding stuff on the street, and then kind of re, uh, I guess in 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 prop language, it's called retrofitting, where you kind of like redesign the stuff that you find by repainting them or embellishing them. Um, I, I, it's called retrofitting. I learned that word from reading the book about the movie Blade Runner when they talked about redesigning their sets. They took already existing things and, you know, embellished them, embellished their facades, not to sound too lofty over here, but, you know, they worked with what was available and then retrofitted them or, you know, embellished the the exteriors of, of buildings in, in the case of Blade Runner. Yeah, um, yeah, it doesn't sound lofty um, at all. It just sounds like you really are looking at what, what you can use and, and looking at sources and getting yourself educated and figuring out how other people have done it. There's, Yeah, exactly. You know, I'm very interested in all of that. It's been a great life getting to be an artist all of these years. I'm 52 now, and I've been doing... I've been able to be an artist since I was a teenager, and um, you know, a lot of people don't get to to have this kind of a of a life, and it's been wonderful to to get to work with Samoa, who I was married to for 17 years. He's the guitarist in the band, and mm-hmm. we're no longer together. But for the first 10 years of our lives, we worked, you know, together um, in Karen Black, and 
mm, after we split up, he decided to start a family, and I went more into being like an exhibiting artist in art galleries and stuff, like doing, for some reason I got invited to become like a museum type of um, artist, and I got to be able to be in all these Whitney Biennial things and galleries around the world and stuff, so my life just sort of like took a turn that I would never really expected. Hmm. I don't think any of us really expected it. So it's not something I sought out, really. Like, um, I knew I always wanted to do creative things, but I never knew it was going to be this good. Well, and without, I mean, seeking without a particular goal in mind is a really interesting way. It's like you're just sort of, you know, riding the the flow of life and just sort of seeing where it goes. And people are going to, of course you know, um, recognize you for for your performance and for your creativity? Well, I know that it's really hard to be an artist as far as, you know, if you go to art school and you, you are the kind of artist that is working all alone in your studio and, the, you know, you have to make slides to show galleries. It's a very demeaning process, and I always discourage people from soliciting their work to galleries. I always suggest to... People that they should, with their friends and with their community, you know, create a scene on their own because it's so discouraging to have to go to a gallery owner and say, will you please look at, you know, my blood and guts and um, evaluate me and possibly give me a show. And, I mean, sometimes that's worked, but for me that's never worked. Um, And I never really pushed my, I think a couple of times I pushed my, art to galleries when I was a lot younger, but I was um, very discouraged and, you know, realizing that people that own galleries are basically people that can afford to pay the rent of the gallery. They're not necessarily experts in art, and um, so it can be a really discouraging process for artists, for young artists, like getting in, getting in, you know, Mm -hmm. and again just coming from music and and stuff and you know fmu is is really independent and there's a lot of artists on fmu and djs that you get much more done and have much more fun if you do it yourself rather than just sort of like wait to be accepted you know absolutely yeah yeah well it's you know and it's it's lovely to see you get recognized what was the um the whitney biennial like the whitney biennial was it was it happens every two years, and they choose about 15 different artists from around the the country to do, um, you know, show their work. And, and in the last few years, it's been more popular to involve interdisciplinary artists or people that do more than just, like, paint or do sculpture. Like, they're more open-minded to a different kind of performance art that's, my performance art is coming from punk and music and I guess um, the value system, there's not as much of a hierarchy of of value the last um, 10 years in the museum system so they were open-minded to let me do my concert there. Um, I did an actual Karen Black concert and then I had a room, an installation room it took place at the um, Park Avenue Armory, which I suggest anyone to go and visit on 66th Street and Park Avenue. It's an old military drill hall. And they gave me a room to make an installation. And then I was able to do a Karen Black concert in the main drill hall, which was 10,000 square feet. Wow. And I was I built a stage, and I got to work with all these different people, like really amazing lighting designers and technology that I'd never, ever been exposed to before. And I got to involve 30 girls of Karen Black rather than the eight that I use. I usually have about four to eight dancers usually. So this time I had 30. Mm. And so I, I made a book of this, Diane. It's called butalism and it's kind of I think it's available on Amazon and you can see it online as well so but it was a fantastic experience my parents came from Los Angeles to 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 the show and my all my friends came and everyone from the Lower East Side would stop me 
on the street and say, hey, I saw you in the Whitney. That's great. You made it. You finally made it. And I just kept thinking, well, I I felt like I've been making it forever. I don't know <laughs> if I finally made it, but everybody was really impressed by this museum thing, and they were all excited for me. Mm-hmm. Oh, and then yeah. I did, in my installation room, I did this thing where I, I showed, I exhibited butt prints. I, I got paper and painted my um, tush, tush, the different colors, body of uh, using my body paint, the Karen Black body paint. I, I painted my butt and sat on the paper, and I made these butt prints, and that's <laughs> what I showed. Awesome. And those were really popular, too. So I had the Whitney Biennial, I got to have a big concert, and I got to sit on paper and make butt prints. Nice. It was really funny to me. That would be funny to anybody. It would be, that would be fun. And then I saw a movie by Jodorowsky called, um, I think it was, you know, Jodorowsky made this, this movie. What's his famous movie? I can't, I can't think of it right at this moment, but there's a whole scene where there, a woman does butt printing as well, so it's kind of like not the first time that's been done, that's for sure. So, Well, it, it, that's, that's almost a, I don't know, I've, I've always <laughs> felt that, that uh, art having to do with the body itself is really almost more natural for us than to, to you know, to draw or to use an instrument, you know. Yeah, yeah. true. True. Well, it's it, it's interesting that your friends like the or the the feedback that you got like oh you've made it you know because like you said you've been creating all this time and uh, and it's a nice a, a really nice thing. The name of the book is Butalism. Yeah. Yeah. I just I did found it. Yeah, it's on uh, it is on Amazon. And mm-hmm. uh, oh, goody, Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have any words on the the passing of Karen Black? Hold on. Hold on one sec. Steph, sure. Can you hold on? Yes. We are WFMU East Orange, WMFU Mount Hope in Rockland County at 91.9 FM. The door. Oh, okay. People are coming to the door because of my loadout change of schedule. Ah. So people are buzzing me on there, knocking on my door. There's a lot of big changes today because of schedule change with right. the show. So right, because of the show. That. Well, that's okay. Thank you for making the time. To uh, to talk to us anyway. But what were you, what were you just saying, Diane? Um, I wanted to know if you had any words on the passing of Karen Black. Well, I I got to meet Karen Black. Thankfully, um, she introduced us the first time we went to Los Angeles in '92. <laughs> wow, and that was before this like recent sort of acceptance of performance art as like everybody knows what it is. You know, Marina Bramowicz, the great lady Eastern European performance artist, has really put performance on the map since she did that whole Museum of Modern Art piece, I think, where people sat and regarded her and just, you know, I think that she exposed the whole world, world to performance in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a much broader way. But back then in 92, performance art was still, we were still sort of thought of as like the fools of the rock world or the, <laughs> you know, even... It wasn't the kind of performance that even the art world was traditionally really, you know, interested in. It wasn't maybe serious in a certain way. So Karen Black really went out on a limb, and she showed up at the concert and introduced us, and she hung out with us all night. And she said um, to us at the end of the night, she took my hand and she said, you know, you're an artist. And I was like, oh, really? Thank you for, you know, no one had even really ever said that to me before Hmm. she just completely got it and um i've loved her films forever everything she's ever done anything she's done anything she's in she's completely brilliant and um so i'm i'm very sad that she died her husband was is wonderful um stephen uh, eckleberry and um he's carrying the torch for her by keeping, you know, her her uh, her artwork and films out there and I, I, I hope that I can help him to do to do whatever I can, you know, to help preserve her, her legacy, um, just by way of doing benefits to help with anything they might need or just, I don't know, to participate in anything that the, 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 their family would need. 
you know, to, as I said, to preserve Karen Black's work. But she was a wonderful, beautiful woman. We also performed together with Lou Reed at UCLA oh, wow. um, one Halloween, um, and she did The Raven. And um, she was just, it's very sad that she died, but, you know, a, a woman that I know who just died a couple of days ago, Maggie Estep, who was mm. a spoken word poet and writer, and she died at 50. Yeah from a heart attack, and all I can say about Karen Black's passing is I'm glad she got to be so loved and live to be 70, and um, they're 70, well over 70, you know, 73 or something. Yeah, and we do all get to appreciate her. I mean, luckily, she did give the world something so we can, you know, look at her work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Her films are so wonderful if people, if you don't know about them, if any listeners don't know about Karen Black films, I'd suggest Day of the Locust. I'd suggest Come Back to the Five and Dime Jimmy Dean or Five Easy Pieces, who is, which oh, is yes. by Bob Raffleson, who is the creator of The Monkees. That's a great piece. That's a great film. Oh, um, totally. Yeah. Or I would suggest um, Day of the Locust is really one of my favorites. Um the Great Gatsby, she's wonderful in, and she's kind of known to be a horror film actress, but she really is is just a great beauty and was was in like so many diverse roles. You know, um, she played a trans transgender person in Come Back to the Five and Dime, Jimmy Dean, and she was kind of ahead of her time in that too. You know, um, playing a trans person. You know, um, she did that in the seventies. So I would just spend time looking at everything. She had a wonderful voice. She wrote the songs that she did, or a few of them in the movie Nashville, and she sang them as well. Hmm. So she was a songwriter, too. I loved her singing voice, and um, her husband told me that she was really a shy singer, oddly enough. (laughs) She was a shy rock performer, which Hmm. is surprising to me. But I just saw him right after she passed away. I went to Los Angeles to visit him, and he was just really reeling from her, her death, and he actually had to move right after she died as well, which was why we wanted to help with the benefit, because he had to downsize his whole life. He'd spent so many years caregiving with her. You know, he, he was having a difficult time hmm. keeping things going, um, and her her medical expenses were so so vast. They, you know, she had done like a Kickstarter with her medical expenses at one point, you know. Mm. Wow. So that was another reason why we wanted to help out the family, yeah. just because he, her husband had to move very quickly after she passed away. So. Mm. And it's great that you were there for him. Pardon you know? me? It's great that you were there for him, that you supported, you know. We're, we're oh, just gosh, there to... I didn't do much except just. We just had a little snack and stuff, but, no, but I, I want to be more available for them. I We have so such dire conditions of living in New York, and he knows that as well. You know, we're struggling, all of us, to keep our apartments going in New York. Mm-hmm. Um, I, don't, I don't have an ostentatious life at all here. I'm still struggling to, to keep myself afloat in the Lower East Side. That sometimes all you need to, all that somebody needs sometimes is to know that somebody is there and somebody, you know, gets where you're at and and really appreciates who yeah, you are and what you I you've hope done. that he does. I hope that he realizes that all of the Karen Black fans loved her so much, you know. Mm, yeah. Um, I think he does. He's on Facebook and he's kind of uh, approachable, reachable on Facebook. Oh, wow. If that people want to find out about Karen Black or what's going on with with her work and stuff, you could reach out to him on Facebook. Oh, that's cool. 